as if the phenomenon of the nuraghi were not complex enough to frame, it is part of an archaeological context that presents numerous other equally mysterious ancient vestiges, which I now present with the aim of illustrating firstly the wealth of ancient structures present in Sardinia, and secondly with the faint hope that they may help shed some light on the mysteries of this island. Giants' graves are also widespread in Sardinia. Nurnet catalogues more than 500 of them, and according to the last census carried out in 2003, there are 800 of them. These numbers, although around one-tenth of the number of the Nuragi, are nevertheless considerable. But let us see what these monuments look like. In the north of Sardinia, in a slightly elevated position, is the giant's grave Lilolgi. At first glance, one sees a series of lined-up megalithic slabs, flat and wide. The central boulder, 4 meters high and weighing an estimated 4 or 5 tons, has a small opening at its base and carved cornices on its front face. Allora, la lastra, so, this lab I estimate to be about 4 meters high, has a width of 1, 2, almost 2.5 meters, and a depth of about 23 to 25 centimeters. Circa 23-25 centimetri. The slabs are made of granite, and looking closer, one can see that the alignment is not along a straight line, but makes a slight curve. From the opening in the central boulder starts a long room bordered by large stones that consists of two rooms separated by a vertical slab. Around it, the remains of a larger structure made of small stones can be identified. Very similar in appearance is the giant's grave of Caddu Vecchio, a few kilometers from the Lilolgi tomb. The central slab even reaches a height of 4.4 meters. The general characteristics are very similar, with a small opening at the base of the central slab, also decorated with carved cornices. Molto simile a Lilolgi. Very similar to Lilolgi, placed on a sloping terrain, there are six stones on each side, so 13 in all. The room behind the stones is better preserved and still has a number of roofing stones as well as the walls bordering it. Either it has been rebuilt or yes, it is better preserved. And here the tomb from behind. Yes, here one can see also the ovoid shape of the back. Sì, qua si vede anche la forma ovoidale della parte dietro. Of a rather different type is the giant's grave Sadomu Sorcu, located on the Giara di Siddi in south central Sardinia. This tomb, instead of vertical slabs, as a front composed of rows of large boulders. The entrance, although still relatively low, is large enough to be accessible. The interior is very well preserved, almost three meters high and covered with large slabs.
This tomb also features a side niche. The length of the room is over 12 meters. The front wall is also slightly curved. Again we encounter really large boulders and around the tomb there are many fallen boulders. The overall height is about 4 meters. The outer masonry of the room is also made of large boulders and is very well preserved. The last tomb I am presenting is also of a similar shape. Half an hour's walk from the road, immersed in a beautiful landscape of pink granite, is the giant's grave of Barran Cumanno. Molto bella. Very beautiful, very large, very well preserved. There are some boulders, like the lintel, you see, which is gigantic. It will be 80 centimeters high by 1 meter and 30, 1 meter and 40 wide, and I don't know how deep. But it is not the only one. This boulder is also really giant, as are the boulders that are above, at the top. The whole structure will be, I estimate, even something over 4 meters tall. The small entrance, about half a meter high, gives access to a very well-preserved but smaller room than that of Sadomu Sorku. The so-called sepulchral area will be 8-9 meters long and with a variable height around 2 meters. The outer wall of the room is covered with trees and seems to merge with the natural rocky substratum. Those are the rocks of the front, and this is where the entire inner chamber develops. Again, there are giant roofing slabs leading to the curved front exedra. And from here you can see that the two wings, the two horns, bend slightly forward. There are magnificent weathered rocks in the area. The giant's graves I visited can be divided in two types. The first type, with a front composed of large vertically placed slabs, is called the dolmen type. The second, composed of parallel planes of large stones, is called the row type. Regardless of the type, the tombs show a similar plan, consisting of a curved front and a room extending behind the center of the front wall. All tombs are composed of large boulders or slabs of rock. Other tombs encountered during my travels showed similar features, although the state of preservation was much worse. To the mystery of the Nuragi, we can now add that of the giant's graves. Going in order, let us start with the name. It is believed today that the term giant's grave is a figment of popular imagination. According to tradition, these large monuments were intended to house the remains of the deceased of a mythical population of giants who lived on the island in the distant past. We will return to this subject. According to official archaeology, the giant's graves date back to pre-Neuragic cultures to 1800 BC, later taken over and modified by the Neuragics during the Bronze Age and were funerary monuments in which the bones of the deceased were collected. Several cults are associated with the tombs, including that of the god Taurus and that of the mother goddess. 
This is derived by the shape of the tombs, which could resemble the head of a bull, as well as the shape of a womb. According to other hypotheses, the tombs were not really tombs, but the deceased was placed there for a short time, one, two days, in order to allow his or her soul access to the world of the heavens. The small doorway to the mortuary would represent a doorway to this world, and this would explain the small size, which in some cases is only large enough to allow a child to pass through. Although the La Marmora also aligns himself with the idea that they were tombs, explicitly ruling out the existence of giants, he reports the opinion of other scholars of his times, who considered them to be religious monuments. We continue our voyage of discovery by presenting another type of monument scattered over the territory of Sardinia. In Sardinia, depending on the source, between 60 and 120 structures linked to the cult of water have been found. Some of these are called holy wells. The first holy well I am presenting is located in the south of Sardinia, and it gave me an initial surprise. In order to better preserve the structure, a protective roof had been built, but it has since collapsed, covering the entire site. However, other visitors have opened a passageway that still allows the well to be visited. Inside, there is a descending staircase leading to the well. two stone beams cross the descending corridor. The well itself is a circular basin surmounted by a chimney that narrows towards the top and ends in an opening. The well still contains water. The province of Nuoro is located in the mountains, with breathtaking views of the surrounding territories. And this region, in the vicinity of the town of Orune, is the sacred spring of Sutempiesu, of a completely different type and unique in its kind. Leaning against the steep rock face, the temple immediately stands out for the precision with which it was built. It is also noteworthy that these boulders are made of basalt, a stone that is not found in the area and must therefore have been brought from a quarry presumably 40 kilometers away. Part of the roof has collapsed due to a landslide that almost completely covered it. It was discovered in the 1950s during work on the aquifer. Between the two projecting walls are two monolithic arches. The pool itself is relatively small and grafted into the stone structure, with steps below the surface of the water, as well as inverted steps on the ceiling. In order to make the pool watertight, lead was poured between the boulders. Above the pool is a thallus with arched ogive walls, 1.8 meters high, which I was not able to film. In the pool is a ditch presumably designed to accumulate silt and keep the rest of the tank clean. The water inflow is via a hole below the water level. An external drain leads the water to a second small pool located a little further downstream beyond the small wall.
The sun at dawn on the summer solstice illuminates the pool. I noticed some constructional details vaguely reminiscent of the polygonal constructions of central Italy. In addition to single boulders with more than four sides, other boulders have been cut at an angle. Some small niches are included in the walls. The rows of boulders are aligned to create an indentation. Part of the roof dripstones are made from individual blocks into which the dripstones have been carved. Some researchers believe that the shale walls around the monument were built at a later time. Others believe their construction is older. On the roof there are some mameliform appendages chiseled into the face of the blocks. Their presence is believed to be due to the female element symbolizing water cults. The spring never dries up, even at the hottest time of the year. The Holy Spring of Sutem Pieso was a great novelty in my travels of discovery. Compared to what I have seen so far, it appears to be of completely different workmanship, with blocks precisely carved to fit together to perfection and executed with geometric meticulousness. Among the island's most renowned monuments is the Holy Well of Santa Cristina. Its fame is more than deserved. Approaching the well, we initially encounter a wall that, although well built, still recalls the typical construction style of the Nuraghi. But inside two levels of walls appears one of Sardinia's archaeological wonders. A trapezium, bordered by perfectly sculpted blocks, opens in the ground. A flight of steps leads downwards for several meters to a large circular pool containing water at two levels of depth. The blocks above the tank are precisely sculpted to form an ogival dome, ending in an opening, giving us an idea of what the interior of the Sutem Pieso spring must have looked like. At Santa Cristina we also recognize the indentation formed by the rows of boulders, as well as the inverted staircase on the ceiling and some polygonal boulders. I got the feeling of being in Egypt. We also find the T-shaped boulders, previously seen in some Nuraghi. The outer wall enclosing the well has oval shape and the inner wall a keyhole shape a form already seen in other archaeological sites outside Sardinia. At Santa Cristina we also have astronomical alignments. On the days around the equinoxes, the sun enters through the staircase and illuminates the pool. Furthermore, every 18.6 years, a time that corresponds to the cycle of the lunar nodes, moonlight enters through the hole at the top of the well and illuminates the entire wall down to the surface of the water. The well of Santa Cristina is certainly one of the archaeological jewels of the island. The last well I present is located in the vast neuragic sanctuary of Santa Vittoria near Serri. This is the same village where we found a proto-nuraghe. This well is now dried up, 
but shows the same construction style and precision already seen in the two previous wells. Two small openings are presumed to channel rainwater into the well. It is clear that the workmanship of this well is definitely of a higher quality than what we have seen so far at this site. The body of the well is again keyhole shaped. Also around this well is a small wall built in a much rougher style. We will return to the neuralgic sanctuary of Santa Vittoria because it has other very interesting features. Summarizing the characteristics of the holy wells, we can say that three of them are below the surface of the ground with steps leading down to the pool. One is a sacred spring leaning against a rock wall from which it channels water. Three wells present very well cut blocks assembled to create complex structures. One presents the more rough style already observed in the Nuraghi. Above all the wells there is a high vault, often with the shape of a thallus. In at least two wells we see astronomical alignments and we find the shape of a keyhole. The visit to the holy wells adds further questions to the mysteries surrounding the island's ancient history. Officially dated to the Late Bronze Age and Early Iron Age, between 1200 BC and 900 BC, they are attributed to the Neuragic civilization. What everyone seems to agree on is their function, which was religious and sacred, a fact also supported by astronomical alignments. What is puzzling, however, is the considerable difference in construction style compared to the style observed in the Nuraghi. If in the latter, despite the general precision of the structure, roughly carved boulders were used, the diligence of manufacture of the stone blocks used in the holy wells denotes great design and technical skills. But let us continue with our journey. The Domus de Janas, literally House of the Fairies, are another archaeological phenomenon widespread throughout the island. More than 2400 have been discovered, sometimes isolated, sometimes in large groupings. On the edge of the road leading to the Jara di Gesturi, we encountered this strange cave. Excavated in a ledge in the rocky terrain, it is evidently man-made. The entrance has a small antechamber, but is very low, about one meter high. Inside there are several small chambers, one of which has collapsed. On the rock above the cave there are several carvings, but it is difficult to determine whether they are man-made or natural. We did not even know about this place. We were on our way to see the Jara di Gesturi in the hope of encountering some wild horses and on the way, at the roadside, we encountered this place. There are several Domus de Janas in the Pranumutteddu archaeological complex, a site we will see again. The first penetrates the living rock in a flat area, but was not accessible as it was still filled with water. Others can be found on a small rocky hill. The entrances in some are decidedly small, barely allowing a man to pass. Nearby is another one. Again, there are several rooms.
The internal spaces tend to be small, with square floor plan and square entrance. Chris. In this one we can clearly see that there was a room that is now no longer indoors, but is outdoors, and was formed by this boulder that has since collapsed. Around the hill here is yet another one where, among other things, we can clearly see the structure of the sandstone rock in this area. All the slopes of this hill are strewn with Domus de Llanas. And here yet another flooded Damus de Llanas, which clearly shows an interior space. Near the town of Pimentel, in the company of Luigi Muscas, we visit another complex of Damus de Llanas. Again, they are excavated in an area of outcropping rock. The first one we come across is very small, but has some engravings. The impression is that the rock was covered with a form of plaster on which these were made. Further on we find several caves, in some of which the ceiling has collapsed, or has been blown off according to some, thus giving us a clear idea of their layout. Again, the impression is that the walls were plastered. We also find a cave with a long entrance corridor carved into the rock, as well as a pair of so-called cart ruts similar to those seen in Malta. The caves develop like an underground network, sometimes with several entrances. But this one, you say, was always open on both sides? Yes. Wow, what a big one! See how it's worked? Yes. All chiseled. Right. Moving inside the narrow tunnels is not always easy. In another complex, a few dozen meters away, we come across a double pair of very deep cart ruts. These are very similar to those in Malta. They also cross each other. Here, too, part of the ceilings of the Damus de Llanas have collapsed. Some of the entrances are carefully carved. We also find much larger, almost habitable rooms. Nearby there is also a quarry attributed to the Romans, where we could see how the blocks were already cut into the desired shape directly in the quarry. Close to the town of Villa Sant'Antonio are the Domus de Llanas of Genna Salici. They consist of 14 caves, some of which are very well preserved. The main group is located on a slightly curved rock slope. Again, the dimensions range from very small caves, almost inaccessible to an adult man, to some that have beautiful access dromos and entrances over a meter high. 
There are caves with several rooms and cup holes dug into the floor. The largest has an extremely impressive entrance dromos and it is possible to stand inside. I can stand here, you can already hear it's very resonant. In these caves I did some archaeoacoustic experiments detecting a certain persistence in the resonance frequencies despite the different sizes of the various caves. I later visited the rest of the site, noting that each damus has unique characteristics. Some are more carefully carved, others less. Here is one hidden in the trees. It has two rooms. And here we have another one. And again to compartments. The peculiarity is that hexagonal passage that goes to the innermost compartment. Here we come to yet another one. And here we have just a very small room. Here we have yet another one. A circular or semicircular room inside. Yet another one. Apparently small, but looking inside you can see that there is another room on the left. Quite big. We have a rectangular niche, a cup hole on the floor, and there is another strange structure that you can barely make out. It is very dark. The last site of this type that I present is located near Bonorva. The hypogeic necropolis of Sant'Andrea Priu presents new characteristics when compared to the complexes visited so far. The site consists of more than 20 caves. The top of the rocky outcrop is carved in the shape of what is now believed to represent a bull. The bull is believed to have been destroyed in Christian times because it was considered to be a pagan symbol. Again, there are several small caves with several rooms and carvings on the floor. The rock is trachytic tough, a relatively soft volcanic rock. We have had partial collapses. Some are definitely larger in size, with strong resonances, several rooms and more symbols engraved in the floor. There is also a column here. The roof is sloping on two sides. Tall, finely decorated caves alternate with very small ones. The main cave of the site is very large. In the antechamber there is a sun engraved on the ceiling. The rooms are up to three meters high and have several columns. Today there's still painted plaster with frescoes, a legacy of later use by the Christians.
This cave has 19 rooms, three of which are very large. It is interesting to note that although the site is now considered an ancient necropolis, the Christian who colonized it made religious use of it. All the Domus de Llanos we visited are carved into the living rock. They are generally small in size with a few exceptions. They often consist of several rooms connected by narrow entrances, sometimes not large enough for a fully grown man. In some cases, they have entrance corridors and carvings on the floor, ceiling and walls. In some, it appears as if the walls were covered with a layer of plaster. They are found individually as well as in large groupings. The Domus de Llanas add to the list of remarkable sites on the island. Officially dated to the Neolithic period, they are believed to be between 4,000 and over 6,000 years old and are said to have been built as tombs by pre-Neuragic cultures. Their subsequent use, both by the Neuragic culture and later by Christians, is evident from what has been shown. According to tradition, they were, as their name suggests, houses of the fairies. De La Marmora describes visits to some Damos de Llanas, leaning towards their funerary use, but maintains some reservations due to details he observed that cannot be framed in the sepulchral explanation. Indeed, some doubts about their use remain, considering that many inner rooms have doorways too small for an adult man to enter, and the shape of the rooms tends to be square instead of being an elongated rectangle as one would expect from a tomb. Furthermore, the multi-room Domus de Llanas begged the question of what the organizational plan of these tombs was, as, given their size, they would obviously have housed more dead people, but this would mean that they were regularly reopened and rooms were added every time someone died so that they could be carried in their place of internal peace. We also leave the Damus de Llanas for further consideration and proceed on our tour of other monuments in Sardinia. Since megalithism, as we have seen, is widespread in Sardinia, this official term is somewhat vague. I now want to present that aspect of megalithism linked to monuments found in many places in the world and generally referred to as menhirs and dolmens. In Sardinia, Nurnet lists almost 100 sites with dolmens and about 120 sites where menhirs are found, making the phenomenon quite common. Almost six meters high, the menhir of Monte Currutundu, near Villa Sant'Antonio, is among the largest in Sardinia. Next to it is a stone that may have been the top. The single stone of which it is made is clearly worked to give it a tapered shape. It is about a meter in diameter at the base, one half of which is square, the other rounded. The total weight is estimated to be between 6 and 10 tons. On the walk through the fields that led me to this man here, I encountered some cart ruts. I was left wondering whether they are ancient or recent. A few kilometers away is the much smaller man here of Carabassa. It also appears to be chiseled and the top is broken but put back in place. On my visit to this man here, at the car park where I left the car, I met a gentleman who invited me to enter his grounds, where I found two large men here still standing and other large stones that have fallen to the ground. As far as I know, these men here are still unlisted.
In the archaeological complex of Prano Muteddu, near Goni, and where we have already visited some Damos de Llanas, there is a row of 17 menhirs. And the alignment of the row of menhirs is almost perfectly on the east-west axis. The largest ones reach a height of 2 meters. The entire site is strewn with a total of 60 menhirs. And here we have 7 menhirs again. Other strange carved rocks are found that vaguely resemble the Domus de Llanas. And this is the whole complex, set in a double or triple circle of stones. The Prano Muteddu site would deserve a documentary of its own for the wealth of artifacts found here. For now, what I want to highlight is the presence of a large number of structures of different types, among which are also many menhirs. In the exact geographical center of Sardinia, at a site called Birue Concas, there are two more rows of menhirs. The first consists of 16 perfectly aligned menhirs. Curious and incomprehensible row of menhirs. The second row, which is even longer, comprises 20 standing menhirs and a couple of fallen ones over a length of 40 to 50 meters. This is the largest, it will be around 2.2 meters high. Here you can see that the alignment is really good. In the spring I was also able to enjoy some wild Mediterranean orchid species in this mountainous location. We have already talked about the archaeological site of Tamuli with regard to three giant's graves in very poor state of preservation. What we want to look at now are the so-called betili, small stone cones about one meter high. There are six of them in total, three of which possess two protrusions that are generally associated with female cults. The last site we visit in this category is the Sacco Veccada Dolmen. One of the largest in the world, it is 5 meters long, 2.2 meters wide and consists of 4 stone slabs. Altogether 2.7 meters high, the stone covering it weighs over 10 tons. In order to protect it from weathering, the dolmen is now covered by a roof losing some of the charm it had before the covering. A niche is also carved into this stone. The door is about half a meter high. This monument is reminiscent of the giant's graves 
and I remembered that one of the two types is called dolmen type giant's grave. To sum up, we saw a large number of menhirs, sometimes placed alone in the landscape, sometimes grouped in large numbers and positioned in straight or circular lines. One side had other small conical menhirs called betili. The only dolmen we visited in Sardinia is among the largest in the world. These ancient artifacts raise new questions. Sardinian menhirs and dolmens are generally attributed to pre-neuragic cultures, erected sometimes between 4000 and 2500 BC. Broadly speaking, they should be contemporary with the Domus de Janus. Little is known about the function of menhirs, with hypotheses ranging from phallic symbols to idols of pagan worship to funerary monuments to astronomical alignments. Dolmens are generally believed to be tombs. We will also re-evaluate these monuments at the end of our exposition in the broader context of ancient monuments that we are presenting. What we note is the fact that the older the monuments are believed to be, the larger are the stones that make them up. Among the later megalithic monuments, we have seen stones that exceed 10 tons and are dated up to 6000 years ago.